Thank you for having me here tonight. What a big group too, 28 participants. That is yeah. like huge, holy cow. So yeah, very cool. Uh, where is everybody? Y'all are like Fredericksburg area, is that right, Linda? Um, actually, we're Kerrville, uh, Hunt, Ingram, Bandera, um, Hill Country, basically Hill Country, Bernie, um, all those areas uh, that aren't in San Antonio. <laughs> okay, well, great, great. Yeah. And um, what I'd like to do, Charlie, um, when you, I want you to give your spiel and what you need them to know. And then I'm going to actually let you introduce yourself and tell you about your business and what you do, because I, with all our testing, I never got your bio. Okay. So I'll jump right in. Um, I want to show a video real quick. So this is kind of uh, just to kick things off. So I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a sec. And share. Y'all ready? Can you yep. still hear me? I can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. Can I have you? everybody else on. My name is Charlie Agar, and I'm a beekeeper in the Texas Hill Country. They call me the honey bear. With bee populations in decline, it's more important now than ever to save these bees. This is my mentor, Al. This is going to be fun. With over 40 years of experience, Al is a real bee guru. <laughs> and this is George. Come to my little vacuum. He's our good friend and a great guy to have around. Our work gets a little crazy, but we love it. This is just wild. I love it. I love it. We're solving somebody's problem. We're putting these bees to work where they're meant to work, somewhere safe and away from people. This is what it's all about. Cool! Woohoo! Everybody clap! Woohoo! I'll think of that. So, uh, can y'all hear me still? Yes. So, uh, who would watch that on TV? Come on, hook me up. Give me uh, the people I can see. Give me a thumbs up. So, that is Charlie B Company, the pilot of a TV show that is now in production. We've gotten some funding by hook or by crook and we are making this uh, it will be on pbs in austin and hopefully in other markets in the fall uh, hopefully with all this covid 19 stuff we're going to be able to shoot so um you know as you can see i'm all about bee removal um i'm all about um connecting with other beekeepers too that's really the the heart of this tv show is me and the boys having fun doing bees. And that's what I want to talk to you all about tonight. Um, I'm going to share a screen again. I'm going to share my PowerPoint and let's jump into some things. Um, so let's see. One sec. Let me make this look pretty. How does that look to y'all? Can you see it? Uh, Linda, do you see the full screen kind of thing? Um, it's it's on the computer view where we can see the slides on the left. So you have to hit the play somehow. You're not on the big one. Okay. Hold on. Yeah, you, you need the, the, the first show. time you put it up, it was okay. How about that? Yeah, now yeah. you got it. All right, great. So uh, I want to talk. So we are in the spring sprint. Linda's all red from being in a bee suit today. It is go 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 time. Can I get an amen? This is this is it, folks. So exciting time to be a beekeeper. Um, it's weird because for me, like. I always tell people when people ask me, how do I want to become a beekeeper? I tell them, you know, beekeeping is better with friends, right? Like those two little fellows on the left there. Um, you know, I found friendships and connection in beekeeping and it's something you kind of do alone, but, um, but, you know, really I found fellowship in bees and beekeeping. I'm a member of the Texas Beekeepers Association. I'm on the board, very active with that group and, uh, love to connect with people. That's kind of my background. So, um, it's tough with this COVID-19 thing, right? So like the little slide on the right there, I've been doing social distancing a long time. Now it's just called beekeeping, right? So there's a lot of beekeepers where we're kind of a maverick lot as well, where we like to be on our own. And, um, and so um, it's, it's a weird mix. It's kind of cool. We can all come together here on Zoom tonight, which is, which is really neat. So um, I'll run through a quick agenda. This is what I'm going to kind of get through quickly, and then I'm going to open to questions. 
I can't help but talk about removals briefly. That's like my, that is my uh, pedigree. That's all I do, really. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in the apiaries now, talk a little bit about swarm prevention, talk a little about swarm prevention, and then open to questions. And when we get there, we don't want to go too granular, but um, that might be something y'all can uh, open up to a forum at the end as well. Uh, caveat. I've been beekeeping for eight years. I do it wrong every day. So I don't want to stand up here and uh, claim authority or having a right way to do things. I think beekeepers in general, um, you know, we are inventive people. And, uh, you know, you ask, ask an opinion of three beekeepers, you get five different answers. So um, I think uh, we have to kind of honor that with one another um, and learn from one another. That's what I love about bee clubs. So I fell in love with this critter in 2013. Um, I had uh, I was living in southern Idaho in Twin Falls, Idaho, in the in the high desert uh, of Idaho. It's where all your McDonald's potato chips potato uh, potatoes come from. It's called the Magic Valley because it's irrigated. And there was a guy who sold all the bee stuff, and he put on a presentation. And my uh, a friend of mine dragged me to this presentation. I was a reluctant beekeeper. I went and. He, and he talked about bees in a way and with a passion that I said, oh, my goodness, like I had more questions. So I went to this thing thinking I don't want anything to do with this. I walked away writing a check, take my money. I want bees. I got two hives, uh, put them out near an alfalfa field. My first year of beekeeping, I got like, you know, five gallons of honey. And I was like, oh, man, I'm the man. And I jarred it up and I gave it to everybody and I was hooked. Moved back to Texas um, that following year, and uh, you know I, I said, "Oh, I'll get into beekeeping here." And a friend of mine had a removal, and I got into the removal world, and um, that's been that's been a short course in in uh, beekeeping. If you want to become a good beekeeper, um, removal stuff is is where it's at. You know, you have an opportunity to see bees in their natural uh, state. You know, um, you kind of see how a hive. They do the same thing in the box that they do in an overturned cistern, right? So, um, so it, it, it fascinates me that I can kind of um, see the same thing wherever I go with bees and then you know, replicate it in my boxes and, and learn about their behavior. So um, bee removals, and I, I imagine there's some of y'all are bee removal people, so I'd love to hear from you too as we go. Um, they're tricky, they're messy, they're dangerous and they're totally addictive. I'm hooked. Um, I started doing them and I, you know, shortly after it spawned, it, you know, I did one removal for a friend for free and for fun. And then it turned into a business. And now it's this side hustle that's taken over. And thankfully right now I run a video production company and uh, video production is not happening right now. Right. So, so thankful uh, today to have bee removals to do and uh, selling nukes and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, bee removals are where it's at. I'm a big, so I want to just run through the basics, and many of you probably know this, but um, if I can cut them out, that's what I want to do. So, I looked at a handful of, of removals today, and it's always the case where if I can get at them, I want to get at them. If I can get to the comb, I'm going to get the comb out. It's, it's ideal because it, it also it gets all the stuff out, right? And it's one and done. You get in there, you get those bees out. Even if it's a tree, if I can cut that tree, you know, if it's the right situation, I, I want to do that. Um, and that's, that's the art of it is working with clients to uh, come, come to terms with what I'm going to take down, um, how it's going to go back up, if I'm going to do it, if they're going to do it, if, if uh, they're going to subcontract it, that kind of thing. And um, then we get into situations where we can't get to the cone, right? So uh, forced, to, can y'all see that okay? Thumbs up. Uh, forced of scones and trap outs, right? Commonly in trees or masonry where we can't get to the comb. Um, this is my, this is my, it's not patented. I stole it from somebody, but I call it patented. It's the witch hat, uh, the witch's hat. It's that cone I put over the front of the colony. I'll use straps. Sometimes I'll use roofing nails to nail it around that, that hole. I did one just yesterday went famously um forced of scones when they got to get out right when you got to get them out immediately right and they got it's got to happen today a trap out is something that takes weeks and you know you 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 put that trap on there you leave a box nearby the bees move into that box so that's a, a, you can't do it when it's right next to somebody's front door because you don't really solve their problem immediately um and uh and you'd also you know you have to have that time so um 
I am mired in these this time of year. I'm getting three to five calls a day. It's just an awesome, awesome thing. I'm connected to a handful of other removal people and, uh, and just have a lot of fun with it. What happens as a removal guy though is, Oh, oh this is, let me talk a little bit about the show. So I've been doing removals getting, you know, since about 2013, my, my beekeeping kind of ramped up. I started getting more and more hives, right? So what do I do? I'm a marketing guy. So I post all that stuff on Facebook and in, Instagram and then you create a YouTube channel and I, I shoot videos. So I'm producing videos. So uh, these guys approached me. Uh, this is this is my competitor here in town. And I do live in New Braunfels. I don't think I've said that yet. So I'm in New Braunfels. Uh, competitor and good friend approached me and said, Oh my gosh, this bee stuff is incredible. We need to make a TV show. And so we kind of struck a deal and uh, we partnered up and we've shot this pilot episode, which you can see currently on, uh, on Amazon prime. And then we took it to festivals. It's done very well. Um, it's won a bunch of awards at festivals. Uh, we we, uh, we shopped it around. Nobody bought it. So Discovery Channel, no. Nat Geo, no. And the guy I'm working with has track record with these people. Why do you think they didn't buy it? This was the rationale. Bees don't rate. They said people don't want people have that ick factor about bees that they, they won't watch TV about it. So we were about to give up when we approached PBS in Austin and they said, we love it, we want it. We love the educational aspect of it, um, and so we we struck a deal. And uh, the the problem is they don't fund it, so we're self funded to make this first first season, and hopefully it'll go somewhere. So it's really a lot of fun to to uh, to be able to tell stories. That's really what I like to do, and uh, tell stories around bees and beekeeping. So um, let's just jump inside our hives now, uh, this time of year. I know y'all are busy. If you're like me, uh, you're rocking and rolling. You've got, you've, got, uh, uh, you've got hives that look like this. Beautiful, right? Eggs, larva, cap larva. They're growing fast. They're getting strong. You've got big, beautiful frames like this. I was in a colony today doing a, setting up for a split, and it looked just like this. And I, I absolutely adore this kind of thing. So uh, that's, you know, that's a big, a deep brood frame just covered in brood. we got a great queen, great laying pattern. We're rocking and rolling. Um, I'm seeing pollen. These, these shots, they're not great. They're just iPhone shots were from just the other day. And, uh, you know, we're fill, everybody's filling up with all that gorgeous blue bonnet pollen. It's orange and all the different color pollens. And I'm even getting hides with nectar already in certain, in certain areas. So, um, we're, I think we're in, we had an epic year last year. I think we're in for a great year this year, uh, despite, you know, not having a winter and the kind of worry about that. But, um, and then we see this. So um, uh, y'all are probably experiencing this right now. Um, we we'll start to see swarm cells. We start to see queen cells. So uh, it's, it's important. Um, I, you can learn from my example. I'm a lazy beekeeper. I'm uh, pretty well distracted. Uh, I run another business by day. That's um, like I like I mentioned. Um, I have you know family commitments. I'm behind right now, right? So I have sixty colonies, many of them large enough, strong enough, ready to split. And this is what's happening inside them. And I have queens coming on Friday, so I'm doing my. Uh, my preparation for my splits and uh excuse me one second sorry about that dogs and uh trying to prevent trying to prevent the swarm so once it gets to this point in my mind it's too late right they, these uh who was the guy from florida state or universe florida state who uh, spoke at a recent convention and he said that the drive for bees to replicate is no less than your average teenager. They are driven to produce queens, to, to uh, replicate, to swarm, and to, cat, to, uh, to colonize. So um, this word drives me nuts. So if you're a bee removal guy, you get calls from people all the time saying, um, my bees are swarming, swarming, they're swarming. So these people throw the word swarm around with bees and then swarm as a noun. And, and like in, uh, 
uh, scientific terms is a is like that first definition 1a it's a group of bees uh, going out and looking for a new place or a colony the other is as a noun or a verb it means fast moving objects right and moving chaotically so a swarm of sightseers a swarm of whatever so so it gets weird and I'm an English major so this is so this is a swarm of bees swarming right um, but uh, but the act, the actual swarming process, as we know, is uh, is that replication process. So parent colony, you know, kicks off half, uh, creates a new queen as they do so. The old queen flies off with half the workers, uh, looking for a new a new colony. Um, and there are a lot of schools of thought on this. There's a gentleman, a friend of mine, uh, Mark, who lives in Marion. Some of y'all might have met him at the uh, TBA. He's part of Bees in the East. It's a real active club uh, down in Marion. And he's a big advocate of letting bees swarm. Let them swarm. Catch them if you can. Uh, it's automatically requeening your colonies. Will they be aggressive? Yes. Right, so the, the your new queen will the your new virgin queen will go mate with the the the, the tough boys in the neighborhood. Um, but uh, will you have hardy, you know, strong colonies? Yes. But um, the uh, for me, really, uh, Africanized bees. The issue with Africanized bees is not aggressiveness; it's their tendency to swarm. So uh, that's why, in fact, I I requeen. And I love I, this, like, this, like, makes me hungry. I don't know if you're like me. I look at this and say, oh, my goodness, this is just such an opportunity. This is a swarm um, I saw down in Pearsall, Texas, with uh, Todd Youngblood, Youngblood Honey. And I was visiting him, and this was out in one of his bee yards. And he's, he wasn't worried about it. He just put a box nearby and shook him in. So as you know, many of you know, you know, catching swarms, you feel like the bee whisperer. It's absolutely a magical process. Um, I, I adore swarms. Um, one of my hives swarmed the other day. I keep bees in a, in a uh, quarry area. And the gentleman who runs the quarry said, hey, there's a big ball of bees hanging on a tree. And then they up and flew away. And I said, yeah, well, that's the bad news is that's, uh, that's half my colony taking off. So uh, sad, sad as, it, as it is, it happens. Um, and catching swarms is, is like the, uh, it's sort of like the uh, first one's free, then you start paying to become a, a, a bee removal guy. Right. You catch a swarm and it's like, wow, free bees. And I can I can, you know, grab them and shake them into a box and take them away. And that kind of gets you excited about doing things like removals. But um, be careful going that route. Removals are addictive. So. And if this swarms get somewhere, that's when I come in. And I do. I, like I said, I'm I'm steady with removals all year long. Small hive removals uh, in water meters and under trailers. Uh, tree bee removals, all that kind of thing. So, um, my last thing I'll talk about is uh, this is this is time to divide and conquer. I'm assuming y'all are are dividing colonies as I am right now. Um, bees are dying to do it, right? So uh, this time of year, uh, your your colonies just they're they're eager to to make this happen. That's their reproductive goal is to replicate the superorganism, and it's a very strong one, as I mentioned. So uh, you have to get ahead of that somehow. And so for me, it's a it's a question of splitting. Um, I, so today, for example, um, I took you know uh, three strong colonies. One of them, and the fourth one wasn't strong enough to split. Three strong colonies. Uh, I had a deep and a medium. And I had brood in both the deep and the medium. And so I went ahead and uh, took the medium off and shook those bees back into the box, put a new box in, uh, in uh, excuse me, and then put a queen excluder, right? So I've got a deep, I'm pretty sure the queen's down in that bottom. I've got a queen excluder and then that medium right on top with brood in it. Uh, close it up. And then I wait till this evening. In fact, I'll probably go back tonight after dark and move those colonies. So move that top box, put a bottom box on it, put a, a bottom board on it and a top. Now I have two colonies and queens arrive on Friday. So I'll introduce queens to, I'll, I'll check both boxes on Friday to see if I have eggs in the one that I'm hoping doesn't have a queen. If I don't see eggs or signs of a queen, I'll go ahead and introduce a new queen to it. But uh, either you're going to do it or the bees are going to do it, right? And uh, the, the timing is the timing is wild. So 
um, why spend the money? So my first couple of years with bees, I was acquiring so many removal bees that I felt like, why would I ever spend any money on bees, right? And uh, that's actually true. I mean, I think you, once you start raising bees and are successful, uh, then you can do things like split your split hives and your, your apiary is going to grow on your own. Um, gentleman in Austin uh, named Chuck, uh, who works there at, uh, it's a uh, bee weaver in, in, uh, Dripping Springs. I, I told Chuck, Oh, I just let my bees requeen themselves and I let them go off. And he said, ah, that's fine. He said, uh, yeah, if you don't mind Africanized bees, that's fine. But he said, uh, how many day? How many days does it take for the bees to raise new queens after you walk away split, right? So if I took that medium box, on top of that, on off of that, uh, off of that deep, and just took that brood away, and took walked it three miles away, walk away split, and let them raise a new queen, it's sixteen days from the moment they uh, they start raising queens, and then uh, that she's got to do her her mating flight. She's got to come back and get ready to start laying 20 something days. Um, he said, how long is the nectar flow in Texas? And, and how much does a jar of honey cost? So for the cost of about four jars of honey, which is really for me, uh, two thirds of a good frame of uh, medium frame, maybe, maybe almost a full frame of, uh, of honey in a, in a, in a medium super, um, I can go buy a queen. And I say all that time and all that time. So that's what convinced me because uh, I'm inherently cheap. So I, what convinced me was not the, Af the, the behavior, which I I'd much rather work with gentle bees if I can. Um, the, what convinced me was the, um, the time factor to, to, uh, to uh, get those bees in there. And the other thing is Africanized bees swarm. I, I, my Africanized colonies just surprise me uh, daily. And, uh, sometimes, I mean, if I, it can be kind of delightful <laughs> and I'll catch swarms in the apiary all the time, that kind of thing. But if I can get control and know the genetic of my queen, um, it's a little, it's a little more time consuming, but it works. So, um, anyway, that's why I spend the money on, on Queens. I'm a little early. We got a little under 30 minutes, but, um, I want to go ahead and open up the questions. I don't want to kind of hold the floor too long. Um, I want to hear what uh, people are are doing these days, and uh, any any questions. So, um, Linda, how do you want to work that? Do you want people to uh, raise their hand or just chime in? I think that if can am I on? Can everybody nod your hand? Okay. My suggestion is if you want to ask a question, because I don't I have a lot of people's names and I don't have them on video. Are you? Do you have everybody on video? I have people's names, but I don't have everybody's video on. No, I think a lot of, and I, that's legit. Nobody wants to be sit there yeah. and themselves picking their nose. <laughs> nose I know. So the thing is, so we can't see them raising their hand. Okay. Right. So my, my suggestion is um, ask the question in chat, like Daryl said. Can everybody find the chat? Or now go to your, if you don't want to, now's the time to be on video. We don't care if you're picking your nose. So everybody go to video mode if you have it. And then, like Daryl said, go ahead and type your messages in on the chat if you know how to do that, and we'll start to answer those questions. And if you can't figure out chat, just wave your hands frantically after he finishes a question, and we'll realize that you can't figure out chat. Okay? Does that sound good? Thumbs up, everybody, that I can see? Okay, so start typing your questions. Thank you for that suggestion, Daryl. And if I, right now, if anybody wants to chime in, that's fine. Just unmute yeah. yourself and hit it. Is yeah. It's on there. It's just those 20. Yeah, those are more. There's more discussion. Um, okay. My question is, uh, what kind of prep are you doing for receiving your new queens that are coming? You said that you did a prep. So what are you doing? Again? So, yeah. So I, today i uh I went ahead and essentially divided the hive. I've heard it called the do little method. I think it's not about doing little, but I think it's somebody's name do little and uh where you and and uh, linda you you and I talked about the vertical split approach you take, so you essentially divide the colony, put a queen excluder, shake all the bees into the bottom box, put a queen excluder 
and then let the nurse bees come up and get onto that brood. So now we've got a box on the bottom we know that has most likely has a queen, a laying queen and, and brood. And then up above, we've got brood and uh, uh, no queen. Whisk that and lots of nurse bees. Whisk that away. I should have mentioned I work, I'm a big fan of the push in cage. So um, I use just a welded wire. Uh, I make it, I, I, I had a picture of it earlier. Um, welded wire and I make it myself. I just use zip ties. I'm a big fan of zip ties and welded wire. I've, the the eight, number eight hardware cloth, you can do so much with that. So I make a little square. Um, I, I go ahead and when I get the queens on Friday, um, I'll go to my, I'll go to my hive. I'll go to my queenless hive full of brood. I'll find a good frame that has resources on it. Maybe uh, brood uh, and open brood and uh, maybe even some pollen, if I'm lucky enough, pollen or even nectar. Uh, and I'll take, I'll shake the bees off that frame. I take it to my vehicle um, and I sit, I sit and I lean my, lean my frame up against the steering wheel and then I'll take the, the queen cage out, right? So um, this is where it gets funny, you know, handling queens is scary. I mean, it's a, for me, it's a $42 little critter running around, but I think the more you do it, you just kind of get used to it. I've lost them in my car <laughs> and had a queen flying around and I just sort of wait and then wait till I see her and I can catch her. But I basically open the, the end of the queen cage that has is open. So no fondant, right. That's just open. And then I put her in the uh, push in cage. I push so I open the open the queen cage, keep my finger on it. I put her in my uh, in my fr against my frame, and I put my push in cage, push it right over on top of her, and I wait till she gets out of that out of that queen cage. So now I know I've got a queen running around inside my queen cage, my push in cage, which is pushed into the comb, and then I introduce it to the box. Um, I I'm a big fan of just making sure they got a lot of food. So right now I don't. I don't bother with pollen. We've got plenty of pollen. I, I just make sure they've got a lot of nectar and I leave them for a week. And when I come back in a week, I want to see that they've accepted her. If they're still kind of bawling all over <laughs> and angry, that's a problem. Maybe there is another queen in there, but um, I, I have pretty good record of getting my queens accepted, the new queens. Um, the only, the caveat to that, it, that is, it seems like the Africanized, colonies, my more aggressive colonies don't seem to take too kindly to, uh, to new Queens. They'll even, um, I've had it where, and I may be, uh, uh anthropomorphizing a little bit, but they like let her, <laughs> seems like they let her lay a few eggs and then make new Queens with those eggs and kill her. They just, her genetic might is just doesn't fit, uh, the big bad hive I put her in. So, but, what are the what size are your trap outs? Okay, I mean those little um the little push pin things. What do you that you make? My my, my push in cages. Yeah, are about uh, they're all different five inches by four inches. Okay. Uh, if in fact with my queen, if I've got if she comes with some attendants, I'll see if I can get some attendants in there. Um, you want to make sure you don't put her in there with bees from the the colony because they'll start chasing her right away so make sure that, that that the bees that you if you trap any into the cage with her are attendants that she came with that are unaffiliated bees not bees from the colony because they won't like her scent and they'll they'll just harass her so good great uh charlie i see we have some questions on chat yeah. So I'll start with the first one from Nate. Can you prevent a hive from swarming if you destroy the swarm cells before they hatch or are they going to swarm anyway? That's a great question. That's what I, um, you know, you first thing you see a queen cell, what do you do? You grab your hive tool, smush, yeah, I'll beat it. Um, you're, 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 you're swimming upstream. Um, it, it, it slows things down, um, but they, if once they're in the mood to do that, um, you can't, you cannot stop the river. So uh, you need to do something. You need to act. 
Um, it's a good, indi- if you have uh, swarm cells, it's just a good indicator it's time. The hives that I split today did not have swarm cells. They did have drones. They were full of drone comb and lots of drones, which means, okay, now they're saying, hey, it's, it's, re- it's mating season. We need to bring the boys in here. So, um, so yeah, if, if you see swarm cells, it's just an indication uh, it's time to do something. So, uh, so how far away did you move your queen, queenless frames of brood and nurse bees do you do your do little splits bees bees not needs yeah um how far did i move so i i have i'm blessed with this one setup i have uh three different yards uh two of which are right nearby one another and then one is about three miles away and they're all on the same property (laughs) and like they're connected across this quarry so i can take this is what i'm going to do after our meeting here i'm going to go out and take my queenless hopefully queenless top boxes and I'm going to whisk them away and I take them three miles away. I think people can get away with not doing that um, because in theory, those bees in the top box are nurse bees, mostly flightless nurse bees. So you're going to keep them. You might get some drift of those bees. If you keep them in the, in the same apiary, you make it some drift back to your original hive. Uh, But I've, I've had them fail like that. So I just feel much better whisking them away and, uh, and, and uh, introducing a queen three miles away. It seems to work really well. Okay. How does the trap out witch's hat capture method work? Yeah. So the trap out, um, the trap out is uh, basically you put a, you're putting a, uh, an entrance, you're closing off the bee's entrance, except for one little hole at the end of the witch's hat. So the witch's hat goes over the front of the hive, and then they have a cone that they can go out, and there's a hole at the end of the cone. They come out the end of that cone, they fly out, and then when they come back, they don't find that hole up here. They try to go in right here where mama is. So you you put that cone on there, and if it's tight, your bees will figure their way out the cone out here, when they come back, they'll fly and they'll form a big ball right around the, the entrance. Uh, so they'll just try to go. They've got that deeply programmed GPS. They'll try to go right back to that right where mama is. So uh, I put a, put a box nearby with some resources in it. Sometimes even a frame of brood from another hive. They like that. Um, it'll, it'll give them an opportunity to even start raising a, a their own queen. And then I wait. Uh, I give I give them time to um, to go ahead and say, okay, we can't get back in with Mama. We'll go here instead. So you go into they'll go into that box nearby, and uh, so you know the challenge with trap outs is they figure out their way back in. There's another hole in the tree or in the masonry, but if you monitor it and make sure they're trapped out so they can't get back in, and then give them a good alternative. I've had cases where I've gotten the queen from a trap out. Uh, I actually forgot about one, left it for like a month and a half, and I'm not even sure, I'm not sure if they requeened themselves with uh, with the brood that I gave them, or if they, um, or if the queen actually got out. But um, I'm pretty merciless with bees. Linda and I were talking about this too, so I get a lot of bees. So as a removal guy, I have, I have more bees than brains. So I have a lot of opportunity to screw up and lose bees and whatever. So um, I'll get a queenless hive and I'm, I'm a big paper marriage fan. I'll even take a weak hive and I'll, I'll take a removal and dump them right on there and say, figure it out, ladies. And uh, it just, it's just a timing thing. Uh, when you come home with two or three new, new colonies in a day, uh, you got to put them somewhere. Um, so, uh, and, and you know, if bees are underperforming, they got, you know, you got to requeen them. You got to do something different. I don't, I don't, I used to, when I had three or four colonies, I was, I would just watch every little thing. And now if there's not, if it's not a productive queen, squish, replace next. Um, there's just no time for that. And then underperforming hives, especially in, and then in fall, I just, I just do paper marriages of weak hives. I'll kill the, kill the weaker queen and, and mix them together. I want that big bulk of uh, bees and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, as a beekeeper, I, 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 I neglected to mention this Gretchen Bee Ranch uh, over in Seguin, Mark Gretchen. He's an awesome resource. He's a mentor of mine. My, my mentor, Al, same. I, I listen, I listen to a lot of different people. I call people uh, about my bees all the time. And uh, there's really the, the three things about beekeeping. There's three things you can control, right? 
you can control nutrition. You can c- control uh, the oh shit. <laughs> you can d- control your your uh, the quality of your queen, and you can control if you can control mites. That's it. So as a beekeeper, I'm thinking about. Am I feeding them? Are they? Do they have the right amount of tr- nutrition for this the right time of year? Uh, for example, you, you could have fed bees all winter this year, but if you fed a strong colony in the middle of winter, then they start making brood. Now you got to keep feeding them, and it, it's and they they they're not it, the timing wasn't right. So I only fed you know uh, weak colonies this winter, which was kind of a unique opportunity. So and then so quality of, of food. Uh, the quality of your queen, and then uh, mites, and of course mites are the, the that's a that's a whole topic in itself. Okay, I'm in the Lukenbach area. I have nine hives. Die last summer. How do I clean up the frames with plastic foundation? So you had oh so uh, yeah I I I have hives fail all the time. I'll let the bees. I'll put I'll put a box out. Let the bees clean it, pick it off. If it's um. If it's got uh, wax moth on it, uh, I'm going to scrape that off. I'm going to freeze the frames. I've got a uh, just a box freezer. I throw a lot of stuff in the freezer to make sure I kill off uh, wax moth or, or hive beetle. Um, but sometimes frames are just too yuck. I'll just toss them. I don't need to. I don't need that. Uh, I don't need that around. But uh, yeah, clean off the junk and uh, and then freeze them if there's critters. Linda, you have your hand up. Charlie, do you ever, re, um, on the foundations, do you ever wax them over again? I do, yeah. So I do re-wax foundations now and again. I'll sometimes, you know, I find um, the uh, those plastic hives, those black plastic self-contained frames, uh, th- those need wax. But I find the, uh, the, the plastic, the, the plastic base, what's it called? The, um, uh, the found, needs, yellow foundation. Yeah, the yellow one? foundation. I I find sometimes even if it doesn't have wax on it, if it's in the right spot, they'll work it. They will figure it out. Um, I'll take. I'll sometimes just take a piece of dry um, wax and just rub it on a frame. Um, I, I'm pretty. Um, like I said, it's getting to where I have so many hives. I'm not as meticulous about my beekeeping as I once was, and I kind of let the bees figure it out. Um, but uh, but. And, you know, a lot of the hives, I start, start with that, uh, comb that's cut out comb in a frame with, with, uh, rubber bands around it. I used to cut out a whole bunch when I do cutouts, I'd have like a full box of cutout. Now I give them two frames of cutout. I find the two nicest pieces of brood from the colony. I put that in there. I dump the bees in front of the hive. Here, I'll show you all a quick video. In fact, I think it'd be kind of neat, uh, of, of how I, uh, how I hive bees up. Just one second here. Um, not a fancy video, but this is this is what I do, like a lot. Um, looks like this. Ready? So that box has four or five frames of uh, of cut out Watch comb in it. Bees. It's dark. It's look it's near queen, dusk. Queen. I'll sit here and look for the queen right now. We're gonna go right in that hive. Um, sometimes I'll see her w- trudging right in. Um, they love that smell of that colony right there now, so go. they're gonna go in. They'll spread out a little bit, and then sometimes I'll even use a brush or just shake that bore. I I, I shake them onto a uh, an inner yeah. cover right out in front of the hive. But look at them going in. Right, it's sort of like let the bees figure it out. Give them a little bit of resources. And then I let them get to work. Um, and if they're successful, uh, these are bees that I'm going to uh, I'm going to most likely requeen uh, over time. So uh, this this time of year I start now I now queens are available. I start assessing highs. But isn't that amazing that I you know you feel like the bee whisperer when uh, when you get you shake the bees in front of the hive and they they go where you want them to go. Uh, it says next question. Do you prefer to requeen in the spring or fall? Uh, for me, it doesn't matter. I guess right now, I, as I mentioned, I'm trying to catch the nectar flow. So if I can, in fact, um, if I can get uh, ahead of the nectar flow 
So I want I want a, a deep brood box that's got a laying queen. I'll get, get as many, uh, I work eight frame hives, eight frame deeps full of bees and a laying queen. I want to get as many of those as I can right now without, without, without stepping back too much, without dividing my hives too much. And then I catch that nectar flow. Then I get my, my production hives. I'm going to get a bunch of honey out of that. Thereafter, I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about hives for selling to other people, which is something I'm really just starting to do. And I'm also just greedy. I just want more bees. I'm like, totally, it's a mental illness. So, um, so I will requeen. I'll often, um, in the fall, for me, I end up with so many Africanized colonies that the fall is a great time to just assess them. There's t plenty of queens available up until like, what, October, uh, end of September, October, to say, hey, these bees are nasty. I'm going to go in, I'm going to kill that mean queen, and I'm going to requeen them, and I can take that time to do it. Otherwise, I just leave them alone. Um, sometimes I just let them swarm. Um, I've been accused of uh, being like the um, the uh, the exterminator who brings a jar of, of, uh, of uh, termites to the job and shakes them into the, into the foundation and says, oh, look, you have termites. So a friend of mine said, so your bees swarm, and they go move into somebody's garage, and then you show up and charge them a hundred bucks to, to remove them. And it's sort of like, oops, sorry. But uh, my Africanized colonies sometimes get out of hand. I have more time to mess with them in the fall and I'll do just that. And I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about who's going to, who's going to make it to through the winter. Right. I'm so, yeah, I want to make sure who's strong enough to make it in the winter. Okay. Do you ever put a new queen in that top half of your do little split with the brood and nurse bees, the box above the queen separator, while the old queen is in the bottom box before you actually remove the boxes? That's a great question. Um, who was I? Linda and I were talking about that yesterday, uh, putting a second queen excluder uh, in, in between those. Is that right, Linda? You put it crosswise. In, and I don't do that. I walk away. I, I guess, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm making too much work for myself. I'm open to suggestions, but I tend to, uh, I tend to just like, I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to walk those three hives, three miles. I'm going to put them in my vehicle, walk, you know, take them three miles away. And then on Friday, they'll get new, they'll, they'll have a, a few days here where they're going to feel no, they're going to smell no queen mandibular pheromone they're going to be freaking out they're going to be dying to make new queens they're going to be ma hopefully making queen cells and then when they get that queen on friday they're going to be elated they're going to, oh, she's finally here I think one of, uh, charlie one of the reasons i think that um the vertical split after we were talking is when you don't have the availability of bringing your bees someplace else that's yeah. where vertical split where you can put the queen on the top and then the queen on the bottom and then they're divided and flown the different ways when you don't have the choice of bringing them the three miles and you don't want to take that chance of just putting them side by side and losing a lot and you lose a lot of downtime so that's the advantage with doing the both on the I top. think that's smart as a beekeeper yeah the more you uh so I end up driving around a lot for my bees my I try to keep my my apiaries close to New Braunfels but Ever since I started beekeeping here, I've had a I had a third acre in downtown Braunfels when I started, and neighbors just right on top of me. So I would keep a few colonies in there. But if, as y'all know, if 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 your neighbor sees some flying insect, it automatically it's yours. So I said, you know what, I'm getting out of this business of of dealing with neighbors, and so I'll. I've just made deals with ranch ranchers to put bees on their property. Now I, I do ag exemptions. So I take bees out and lease them out for ag exemption. So I've got, yeah, I've got a lot of yards. It's a, it is a luxury, but, uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a good solution. If you can't do the walk away. Um, the other thing is if you can't do, if you don't think you can do the walk away, talk to another beekeeper. That's the great thing about bee clubs is you say, Hey, can I bring, this uh, this uh, queenless hive to your apiary for you know a month or a couple weeks to get them s settled. Once you get them settled and and they got a queen in them, move them back and uh, and uh, they'll do just fine. So um, another question going back to when you showed us the picture of the cell that had the swarm cells already. So they were already in swarm mentality. We know it's too late. Um, to try to maximize maybe losing them. What I've done in the past, and I've had varying amounts of success, is I have taken the frames out that have the cells, 
and load that into a box uh, with tons of capped brood and laying uh, uncapped brood eggs and everything. So I basically split the hive that it was in, took any of those out, so at least that hive won't leave. And there's enough nurse bees, there's enough cap brood to keep it going, so if, they, if those swarm cells don't come out with a good queen, they still have material to make another. And then the other one, um, I'm, I put on an, and give them some more room. Plus, I've already taken some bees, and I'm hoping to knock off them from swarming. Does mm -hmm. um, that make sense to you? That, that's legit. Yep. Okay. Um, that, that's, that works just fine. So, yeah, moving yeah. those peanuts all together is good. <laughs> Rather than squishing them, you know, just put them all in a box together and start yeah. your split that way and just hope that you don't get the original box to swarm again. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions that you don't want to put on chat? Raise your hand or just unmute and ask Charlie. Can't imagine nobody has questions. <laughs> if you don't have questions, I'll ask questions. <laughs> Chat question, Charlie. Oh, great. VSH queen. Help me out. I don't know what that is. That's the varroa hygienic sensitive. Italian VHS, all the stuff to help with the varroa mites. I mean, uh, I buy I buy queens from through Gretchen B Ranch, and I believe they get their queens in East Texas. Um, they do fine. Um, I do I do treat for mites. I hate to do it, but um, I have, uh, I've also had good luck with bee weaver queens and they sort of claim to be treatment free. Um, I treat them, <laughs> I hate to say it, I'm an oxalic acid guy. I don't, I've just had too many winners losing way too many colonies. And, uh, I feel like if you follow the directions with oxalic acid, um, uh, it seems to work well. Uh, Which is yeah, I hate doing it. I hate doing it. I wish I wish I could just do the way I did it when I started out and let the bees, you know, be natural, man. They're totally natural. But again, the issue is not so much the uh, aggressive bees; it's uh, swarming. And uh, I, I've had I've had bees swarm. Um, I've caught swarms in uh, in December. I don't know if y'all have run into that. I've caught uh strong swarms in texas in december and that's i mean that's just that's just an africanized colony knowing they don't have a tough winter ahead they're a tropical bee and they're going to act tropically and as a beekeeper it's in my mind it's not uh it's not um not what i not, didn't work great for me uh question is what is the best time to treat for mites um so so I'm a big oxalic guy, as I mentioned. That's when you want your you want to use oxalic when your hives are broodless. So I'll do oxalic treatments. It's sort of my Christmas present to bees. Usually Christmas and New Year's, they get uh, a one or two treatments depending on uh, my time. Usually two. Um, I've used Apovar in summer. <sighs> I hate doing that. That's a heavy duty chemical. But again, if you follow the directions with these and then, and if you're doing a, a integrative pest management, um, those are the nuclear bombs of new in integrative pe pest management, right? So you can do things like, and I'll still do the one, one thing I will do quite often. And I did this the other day. I opened a hive, had a full medium frame with nothing but drone brood in it. I just took it away from them. Not because I'm worried about the drones. It's because mites love dr uh, drone brood. Uh, drone brood's there longer. They can they can propagate more mites. And so I don't need drones. There's plenty of drones in the world. So I just take those take those away, throw it out in a field, let the bees eat on it. And uh, so that's the one kind of low impact thing I do. Uh, but I just find oxalic just works. And then, like I said, uh, last summer I did Apovar, which is pretty invasive uh, in the middle of summer um, for that, what is it, six weeks, however long. it's 42 uh, days. 42 days, yeah. Okay. So it's, 
I hate to do it, but uh, my mic counts are down. I'm not even that um, that uh, uh, aggressive about mic counts. I just follow the treatment regimen. I'll still do mic counts now and again, but frankly, um, you talk to the commercial guys too. Um, you know, and, and I don't, I don't ever try to argue with people like my friend Mark in, in, in Marion, who's a big fan of, you know, natural beekeeping and letting the bees requeen themselves and swarm and all that stuff. That's kind of good bee natural selection. That works great. But, um, I'm still thinking I might want to become a commercial operation and the commercial guys, when you get big enough, um, that just doesn't work. <laughs> you just can't, and I don't know any, uh, decent sized, uh, beekeeping operation that kind of encourages Africanized bees, but um, and uh, I haven't found the the perfect queen. Um, how uh, I'll just skip one question. So, how often do I do mite counts? I do mite counts before and after I treat. Uh, the reason I do that is I want to see if it worked. So, so um, and this year, you know, there were some there were a bunch of hives that I treated in December, and when I looked at them, I didn't think they were going to make it. I couldn't even I couldn't even get enough bees to do, to 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 uh, uh, safely do a, a, a mite count, and uh, I thought I would lose them. And thankfully, it was a merciful winter, and they made it. Um, but yeah, I like to see it before and after, um, and uh, just just for efficacy. Um, so, other questions: Can you use nukes for swarm traps? Yeah, I'm a big fan of swarm traps. I um, again have a lot of the. I, I have one yard, so I have this three yard setup. I mentioned there's two that are together. The two the the two are the good yards. That's yards one and two are good yard. Yard three is three miles away. Bad yard. I call it the dark yard. So I when I when I do bee removals. I take them to the dark yard. They're way in the back of beyond in this quarry. And so uh, not going to bother anybody. I can put, I can put the worst of the worst bees back there so that when I do removals and someone, they're just dangerous bees. I just get as many bees as I can take them to the dark yard. And that's where I kind of do my, I, or the bee hab, I tell, call it. They do get a little bee, uh, bee hab. I have, uh, sw I just leave boxes out. Um, I want to be careful with leaving nukes or any other any box out so that they don't get um, uh, wax moth. But um, I'll go ahead and leave boxes out all the time just to, just to give bees that option. I've caught swarms. I mean, if you I, I caught a beautiful swarm in in the apiary underneath another hive. Uh, it was I guess in the fall of last year, and that hive is it's probably, it's my old queen, right? <laughs> it's an unmarked queen, so I'm not sure if but but. Bio biologically it's the old queen she just didn't fly very far so i went and caught my old queen and now that hive is building up and doing great so that works out great uh do you have any experience to share about brood breaks caging queens after flow as another option for mite control i don't i know about it i have not done it um like i said i'm uh i am open to suggestions and ideas and uh it's just it's funny um, I learned from other people doing it wrong. I don't know if y'all know JJ in, in Austin. He's quite an awesome beekeeper and, and a full timer. And I can pick his brain sometimes about what, what goes on. But, um, no, I don't do uh, brood breaks. What is the best methods to prevent wax moth and hive beetle other than strong hives? Um, yeah, strong hives. Uh, that's exactly it. Um, I had a beekeeper come and visit from Germany uh, excuse me, he was from Austria um, about a year ago. He was in New Braunfels on something and he just Googled beekeepers and he said, I would like to meet a beekeeper in New Braunfels. And so we had this awesome time and I took him out to the yards and he had never seen, they don't have um, small hive beetles so bad in Europe. It's kind of a new thing. So he was fascinated and he wanted to know all about small hive beetle. And I, a couple of my hives had beetle blasters in them you know, those little wells with the excluder on top. So the bees chase the mite in there and they drown. Works great. But um, I find I don't have to manage for a uh, small hive beetle if it's a strong colony. Um, if, you know, if I just make sure they don't have a lot of space, uh, they have just the right amount of extra space so they can't, um, uh, then there's not a lot of space for the small hive beetle to run. Um, and wax moth only happens in a failing uh, 
failing colony. Have you tried a long hive? Uh, no, but my mentor, Al, has. He's a big fan of it. He uh, created a, a Langstroth long hive. I've not done that. I do. I have eight and 10 frame boxes. Um, I'm transitioning. For years, I used only mediums because I did so many cutouts. And medium frames work much better with cutouts. So quite often, when I do a cutout, um, I'll introduce the bees to a just a single medium box. And then the bees will, that'll be my first brood chamber. And then I'd add more mediums. Well, I'd really, I want to get to, I love a good deep brood box. And I'm also going from 10 to eight over time, but I still have kind of a mixture. I wish it was all kind of uniform, but um, no, I haven't had experience with long hives, uh, except for my mentor, Al. He's, he made his own and has done well. Jeannie, Jeannie, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay, I, just, I couldn't tell sometimes with your facial expressions. I just wanted to make sure we weren't missing something with you. Okay, not a problem. Charlie, back to Dan. Dan, Dan says, how do you manage wax moths? Last year I lost hive to wax moths. I now use one part vinegar and one part sugar water with a banana peel. Tracks moths and flies like crazy. I got that from the North Texas Beekeeper Club. That's cool. Um, I would, mm. the only thing I'd, I would say is I don't think you lost hives, your, your bees to, uh, Wax moths, max, wax moths were just a symptom of the hive loss. And, uh, and uh, I, I lose, and you know, I lose bees to mites, I think. And that's the issue. And just bad beekeeping. I'll do something stupid and, and uh, I've done, I'll roll a queen or whatever. I mean, it's all, it's all human error. Um, and uh, if I'm giving the bees what they need, they're going to do just fine. But I don't, I don't lose bees to wax moth. I lose bees to uh, bad nutrition and uh and a crappy queen and uh and of course mites so uh, i'd like to blame it on pesticides and what monsanto does or whatever but it ain't that <laughs> it's uh, it's all me but um but yeah that sounds like an interesting solution um to attract the moths and flies that's neat Well, I will invite y'all, by the way, to watch the TV show. The, uh, the pilot episode of the TV show is on uh, Amazon Prime. If you have Prime, you just search Charlie B or just B and you'll get a whole bunch of different. There's a handful of B programs on Amazon, but uh, Charlie B will come up. I think you have to pay a few bucks to watch it right now. I think it's like $2.99. Um, is it $2.99? Okay, yeah. So yeah. Um, if you watch it, just call me. I'll give you three bucks. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll actually get I'll get the link out Charlie to the club. I'll put it on the Facebook so that they can um get the links to it so that they can get hooked on it. That'd be great. Um, and the only thing I would ask as a favor would be uh write a review if you like it. You watch it and you enjoy it. Uh reviews on Amazon matter quite a lot and then keep an eye out for the show on uh on PBS uh in Austin in in the fall and hopefully other PBS affiliates all over the state of Texas and beyond. So fingers crossed. Good. Charlie, there's one last question that we'll do, and um, then I'll talk after you answer that question. Okay. Are there any trees that bees just love that I can plant? I mean, uh, so, uh, I mean, bees. I don't Charlie, think you're not the plant specialist, are you? I'm not. Bees don't work trees. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, you uh, you do better to plant all kinds of uh, ground cover with uh, with pol with uh, blooming flowers on it. Um. Okay, Charlie, I do appreciate everybody. You don't know how much Charlie put in to help us getting this Zoom on. Uh, he was uh, definitely my helper because I was totally lost and he figured it all out. So I cannot thank him enough for helping us with our first webinar. I'm going to speak a few minutes real quick. Uh, if you guys have any club questions, please ask them on chat right now so I can answer club questions. Um, uh, any parting words? Uh, I'm photo something. Um, Charlie, we're getting lots of good, awesome jobs. Thank you, Charlie. You, uh, you can read the chats coming. This was great. Um, Charlie, I'll be talking with you a little bit down the road.